Hi, this is Linda Shea. I'm co-founder of a crypto fund called Scalar Capital. I'm very passionate about crypto and I'm excited to give an overview of what it is. Uh, I also want to preface this talk with saying this is not investment advice. So I wanted to start off on a personal note about the events that led to my interest in Bitcoin. So my parents are immigrants from China and I grew up in the United States and I was constantly hearing stories about my parents' childhood. In particular, some of the stories that really stood out to me were stories from my mom and her family. So her family was really well educated and fairly well off, but this didn't align with the communist ideals at the time. And so during the Cultural Revolution, um, my mom's side of the family actually had their home raided and had their property seized. So when I came across Bitcoin, I was really fascinated with this idea of unseizable assets. Another event was that my parents were often sending money back home to China. And so I was constantly seeing the inefficiencies of the banking system where it would be just really expensive and time consuming for them to actually send money back home. And I also ended up working at AIG in the risk management department after the financial crisis. And so I really got to see some of the inner workings of the financial system. And through that, got pretty interested in decentralized systems. As I mentioned, the banking system is very inefficient and expensive. So moving money around actually requires the trust of centralized third parties. So because of this, your funds aren't always accessible when the banks are closed. As I mentioned, it can be expensive to actually transfer funds and it takes significant time. So I think a really great example of this is actually in 2008 when Morgan Stanley needed an injection of capital to prevent them from collapsing. And so Mitsubishi UFJ actually agreed to um, send them $9 billion. But since the money was needed urgently and banks were closed in the US and Japan, they actually had to write a $9 billion physical check and hand it in person to Morgan Stanley executives. So this shows that even uh, large financial institutions have issues moving funds around. So not only uh, is the banking system inefficient, but you actually have many people that can't actually access the banking system. So we're pretty fortunate in the US to have a relatively strong banking system, but there are actually over 2 billion unbanked people worldwide. You can't always rely on government-backed currency too. So we're seeing hyperinflation in Venezuela right now. And in the past, we saw hyperinflation in Zimbabwe, where at one point, the $100 trillion note was actually issued. So with all of these issues, there was a quest for digital money for decades. So Bitcoin really wasn't the first digital money out there. There were many other attempts at it. And we really saw Bitcoin kind of form a lot of the ideas that had been developed over time. But in 1983, actually, a world-renowned cryptographer, David Chom, introduced the idea of digital money. And he started a company called DigiCash in 1990, which ended up declaring bankruptcy in 1998. Another company, eGold, started in 1996, and they were allowing for instant transfer of gold ownership. But that was suspended due to legal issues. So these attempts at digital money actually ended up failing because there were centralized points of control. At the time, we really needed these centralized parties, though, because we hadn't figured out how to solve the double spend problem yet. So the double spend problem is actually for digital money that the same money can be spent more than once. So if I have $100 and I spend it with an online merchant, I shouldn't be able to spend that same $100 with another online merchant. And so at the time, we actually needed these centralized parties to keep track of all these transactions on their own ledgers to know whether or not there had been a double spend. There was a key breakthrough in digital money when Satoshi Nakamoto released Bitcoin in 2009. What's really interesting is that no one actually knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is. Uh, it could be a male, female, or a group of people. And I think that's one of the lures of Bitcoin. Uh, Satoshi published a white paper, which is essentially a document that provides technical details. So within the white paper, Satoshi talks about a distributed public ledger. This is essentially a peer-to-peer -peer ledger where everyone can agree on the history of the transactions and agree on the state of the ledger. And so we refer to this as a blockchain. In this industry, you'll also hear the term crypto. Uh, so this actually came from the word cryptography. Um, but in this context, it actually means using cryptography, math, and computer science to make sure currency can't be faked, the record is real and immutable, which means it can't be altered, and the owner is uniquely identified. And so uh, I got this uh, definition from a previous A16C talk, which I really liked. So within this system, miners are extremely important. Miners are computers that validate network transactions. 
So they're solving these really complex mathematical problems. And the first one to solve this mathematical problem gets the right to write to the public ledger. And so this is really complex computational problem. And so the output is really difficult to produce, but easy for others to verify. And so this is known as proof of work. So proof of work is essentially a consensus mechanism where everyone can agree on the state of the transactions and they can agree on the public ledger without having to trust anyone. And so this enables trustless consensus. And so it's really oversimplified to describe this as these complex mathematical problems, but essentially know that that's a very high level description of what's going on in the space. So why would anyone actually want to spend all these resources validating these transactions? Well, actually, when you win the right to write to the public ledger, you actually receive Bitcoin as reward. So it can be quite profitable. And we're actually seeing that right now where there's really intense competition in the mining space. So in the early days, you actually had anyone able to just link up their computer and start validating transactions. So anyone could be a miner. But over time, it's actually required to mine with ASICs, which are application-specific integrated circuits. So this is specialized hardware built for a specific purpose. And in this context, it's built specifically for Bitcoin mining. And so you end up having these stacks of ASICs in these rooms that are air conditioned and they're consuming immense amounts of electricity. Sometimes you'll actually see stats where it says that the total amount of electricity consumed by Bitcoin is actually on par with a small nation. I actually had an experience with this myself because I bought an ASIC and I wanted to mine Bitcoin. And so when I started turning on my ASIC, it was so loud, it sounded like a vacuum cleaner going off at all times. The machine itself was, um, was so hot that I actually ended up having to move this outside of my apartment into a room that was air conditioned full time. So this isn't as accessible for regular people to just start mining on the network in Bitcoin anymore. Bitcoin was really just the beginning. In the early days when Bitcoin got created, there were some copycats of Bitcoin. People were trying to just go after the same use case of digital money or being a store of value. But over time, we really saw more and more crypto assets get created. So on a website called CoinMarketCap, there's 1,600 crypto assets that are actually listed on there. And there's a total market cap of $400 billion. So this is no longer a small industry. Ethereum came along in 2015, and that was a really pivotal moment. Ethereum is a smart contracts platform. And so what is a smart contract? Well, the way I like to actually describe a smart contract is I find this image really helpful. On the left side in gray, you have this image of a legal contract. A legal contract is essentially a bunch of if-then conditions. So if this event happens, then make sure this event happens. And lawyers are responsible for uh, writing this up and executing it. Well, you can really convert a lot of this logic into just code. So the code itself can start self-executing. So on the right, you have a smart contract where this logic is essentially just written out in code. And so a smart contract are programs that are executed by a network of computers. So when I talked about Bitcoin, you had these miners that were validating network transactions. Well, in Ethereum, you have miners that are validating the code in the smart contract. And so what this really enables is you can have transactions that don't require a middleman. And these smart contracts are actually the building blocks for all the other applications that get created. I also want to say that it doesn't have to be legal contracts. That was just kind of what this example was, but there are many other things that can be created through this. A key difference to Ethereum is that the founders are actually known and active in the community, whereas Satoshi isn't known, and we're not really sure if Satoshi is even active anymore. The Ethereum founders raised $18 million in Bitcoin in an initial crowd sale. So crowd sale is essentially a public way to fundraise. One thing that the founders really do is push forward technological innovations on Ethereum. So as I mentioned, uh, in Bitcoin, there's a consensus mechanism called proof of work. This consumes a lot of electricity. But the founders of Ethereum actually are trying to move the uh, platform forward to something called proof of stake instead of proof of work. And so without getting too much into the weeds, uh, proof of stake essentially allows people to have more skin in the game and requires lower electricity consumption. So the point being that the founders really try to push forward innovation on the network. There are thousands of tokens built on Ethereum. So a token is a digital asset that can represent anything from a real world item like gold to something like stocks, to something like bonds, voting rights, or utility rights, rights to use the platform. Anyone can create an Ethereum token. So there's this image of token factory on the right, 
you can just go to this website and you can just create a token really easily. So you just have to enter the total supply, the name of your token, the number of decimal places it's divisible by, and the symbol. It's a really easy process. You can just create a token through this way. And so there's clearly a low barrier to entry. And so that's why you're really seeing thousands of tokens out there. In order for the tokens to actually be valuable, though, you need to make sure the network itself is actually valuable. So imagine if Twitter just launched a token in the early days when they didn't have any users. Then the token itself wouldn't have been valuable at that point. So know that there's a lot more to actually making sure that this token is useful. You'll hear something called decentralized applications or dApps. These are applications that run on decentralized networks. So there's no centralized party that's operating this application. Oftentimes, you'll see that there are tokens required to actually access dApps, but this isn't always the case, but it's a pretty popular trend you're seeing lately. Since there's thousands of tokens out there, not all of them can just get listed on decentralized exchanges, so there needs to be a way to trustlessly exchange these tokens. And so what a decentralized exchange is, is you can essentially exchange tokens through smart contracts, so you no longer need to custody funds with a third party. So you might have heard in the news a term called initial coin offering, or ICO. So what this is, is actually a play on the word initial public offering or IPO. This is essentially a public way to fundraise. This allows teams to raise money for their project by selling some of their tokens. The key difference though, is that ICOs are often done in the really early stages of funding. So oftentimes even before a product has been launched. So imagine the users being able to have stake in Twitter in the really early days. There's tons of money raised through this method. Uh, over the past year, there's been billions of dollars raised. Telegram's ICO alone actually raised $1.7 billion. There are thousands of tokens out there, as I mentioned, and so there are many scams, and there's actually regulatory uncertainty among how uh, these ICOs are conducted. So definitely be really careful before uh, participating in these ICOs. So I talked about decentralized applications or dApps. So I think one of the most important dApps that we've been seeing lately is something called CryptoKitties. We're steadily seeing the number of transactions per day increase on the Ethereum network, there was a huge spike at the end of 2017, early 2018, with the onset of a decentralized application called CryptoKitties. So CryptoKitties is essentially this game where you can collect these online, unique digital cats. And so these cats all have completely new features. You can see here, they all look really different. And so people were collecting these cats. They were breeding these cats together to create completely new digital cats. They were also being able to trade these. Some of these cats were worth a lot of money. And so this may sound really silly to you, but we've seen historically that people really love collecting things. So people collect physical items all the time, like trading cards or coins or stamps or toys or, um, or cars. And so this is really just a way of collecting the digital form. And you can even think of something like collecting artwork. So people love collecting unique artwork. So just imagine if someone like Kanye West were to issue a unique digital collectible, people would really want to own something like this. And I myself was super addicted to CryptoKitties. So I was playing with this game for probably two weeks straight and I spent way too much money on it. It's, it's very addicting and it's really fun. So sometimes in new technology, you often see that the first things that really take off are things along gaming or toys. So Ethereum actually allows for completely new applications that we've never seen before. So I think a really great example of this is Augur. So Augur is a decentralized prediction markets platform. So prediction market is when people are allowed to bet on the likelihood of an event occurring. You can see, uh, I have an image here of Augur's beta. This, in the first prediction market, it says, will Ethereum trade at $2,000 or higher at any time before the end of 2018? And people can bet on the likelihood of this event occurring. So we've had prediction markets in the past. This isn't a completely new concept. But in the past, we've had centralized prediction markets where you had these centralized operators saying what the outcome of the event was, or they were pulling in this information from external news feeds, like something like Reuters. And so this was essentially their oracle, their trusted source of information. Well, Augur doesn't want to rely on these centralized oracles because the whole point is they're trying to be decentralized. So they really need something called a decentralized oracle a decentralized source of information. The way that Augur does this is really interesting. So Augur themselves issued an ICO and they issued a bunch of tokens. And now token holders are randomly selected to report on the outcome of prediction markets. For the first time, you have something like a decentralized Oracle and you can use this to plug this information to other decentralized applications. 
I also want to say that prediction markets aren't just for betting and for something that's fun. You can actually use this for insurance purposes, hedging, or even something called futarchy, which I think is really interesting. So futarchy is when elected officials use the outcome of prediction markets to help them form policy decisions. You can imagine an elected official creating a prediction market saying, well, implementing this specific policy increased the GDP by X percent. And so now people can vote on the likelihood of this event occurring. Now, uh, elected officials can use the outcome of this prediction market to help them uh, inform the decisions they make around the, implementing this policy. And so the idea is that people generally put their money where their mouth is. This will be higher signal for elected officials to know what policies to implement. So I've talked a lot about Ethereum, and that's just because there's a lot of developer activity on Ethereum. But know that not all applications are actually built on Ethereum. And so there are many other blockchains that people are creating. An example of this is Filecoin. Filecoin is a decentralized storage network that has its own native utility token called Filecoin. So Filecoin raised $257 million through private and public sales. They're creating a decentralized version of what we see as centralized data storage platforms, so something like Amazon. And so the way it works is you essentially have all this spare file storage on your computer. So why not rent this out and host files for someone else and get paid for this? People on Filecoin's network actually earn Filecoin for hosting files for other people. And so you can take this Filecoin and exchange it for US dollar, or Bitcoin, or Ether, or some more liquid coin if you don't want to hold on to Filecoin. And so now that you have this new supply of people that have this spare file storage that are now renting out their storage, you can now compete directly with the centralized data storages. And so you can have more competition over prices. And I think that that's really comparable to something like Airbnb where we saw uh, all these people that had spare bedrooms that they weren't otherwise using. So now that they can rent this out, you can have really competitive prices that are competing directly with hotels. An important concept to cover is forks. A fork is when someone copies the code of an open source project and creates a new version. So know that anyone can do this because the whole point is that the project's open source. We expect forks to happen in the really early days, and the coolest thing is that it enables people to conduct multiple experiments at once. This is a really unique scenario where you now have the power in the hands of network owners who can then fork if they don't agree with the original owners. So imagine having two different versions of Facebook. So you have a community that just didn't like the features on the first Facebook, and now they're just going to fork and create a completely new version of Facebook with their own features. You can now just have these multiple experiments running in parallel, which is really fascinating. An example of a fork is a coin that's pretty popular called Litecoin. And so Litecoin is just a fork of Bitcoin. The creator Charlie Lee created Litecoin by just taking Bitcoin's code and copying it and changing a few parameters, like having faster transaction confirmation times, increasing the total supply, and changing the mining algorithm. There's this misconception that Bitcoin and Ethereum are anonymous. Well, that's actually not true. They're pseudonymous, which means it doesn't use the real identity. I have a screenshot here of the Bitcoin blockchain. And so you can see there aren't actual real names on the blockchain, but you see this string of numbers and letters, which represent addresses. But what you can see on the blockchain is you can see transaction details like the transaction amounts, the uh, addresses that were involved in the transaction, and the balances. And so this is not necessarily ideal because a lot of information gets revealed through this process. You might not be able to see who's doing what right now, but there's actually information that gets revealed over time. So let's say you do KYC or know your customer on an exchange that collects your information. Well, now the exchange knows what addresses are tied to your identity. There's also services like Chainalysis and Elliptic, whose sole purpose is to de-anonymize networks like Bitcoin. So they have entire teams of machine learning experts to really try to trace some of these coins and what the identity is. So privacy coins, like Monero and Zcash, actually aim to hide sensitive transaction details. So they think that this uh, information shouldn't be revealed to the public, but you should allow for something called selective transparency. And so this is the idea where you can not default to showing your entire transactions for the world to see, but you can be selectively transparent by showing it to individuals or parties that you want to see. So they have this concept of a view key, which is essentially a key that allows you to access viewing transaction details. So you can share this view key with someone that you want to have see all this sensitive information. So it's really similar to not having your entire bank account history for the world to see, but you can download a bank account statement 
and share that selectively with uh, certain parties. So let's say you want to comply for an audit. So with all of this, there's major technological innovations that are possible. So one interesting one is decentralized autonomous organizations or companies, also called DAOs and DACs. So these are essentially organizations that are run through rules that are encoded in smart contracts. So you can now have networks that replace entire corporations, which is fascinating. Something that's particularly relevant today with what we've been seeing with what's happening with Facebook is that you can now have people own their own identity and reputation data without having this to be in the control of centralized parties. The last thing that really excites me is that you can have users and developers experiment with entirely new governance and economic systems at a much faster rate than we've ever been able to experiment with before. So there are really a lot of major technological innovations through this. What really drew me into this space at first was this idea of digital money and financial innovation. But after having been in this space and learning a lot more, I realized that this is about so much more than just money. So I hope that you're interested in what you've heard today and that you're excited to dig deeper and learn more. Thanks so much.